Hey everyone, Jason here from TextHelp, getting ready to kick off the webinar on remote learning support from TextHelp. Uh, just while people are still logging on, I'll go over a few brief housekeeping items. Um, first, if this is your first time using GoToWebinar, uh, you'll see something like this. And uh, basically there is a little minimize button so that you can kind of scoot the sidebar out of the way and that way it won't be taking up a quarter of your screen. Um, you can also, you probably got the directions on this, but you can use your computer audio or you can always call in as well. You will be muted. This is a, uh, since this is a webinar, there'll be a few hundred people on here. Uh, so you're automatically muted or you can imagine how things could go bad quickly if that wasn't the case. Uh, also, there is a questions area in there. So we're gonna be going over, um, we've got an hour. It sounds like a lot, a lot of time, but it's really not because we've got four products we're gonna walk you through. We're gonna to try to answer questions along the way. If not, uh, don't worry. We get all these questions at the end in addition to the email of the person that sent them. So we'll be sure to follow up or we'll just answer all questions and send that out to everybody to follow up. Uh, at the end of this, actually, you'll hear from Caitlin. Caitlin is our uh, marketing manager in North America. So she, uh, she'll she go through like how you get access to the slides. That's always a big problem you'll, or a big question. You'll get access to the slides for sure. You'll get access to this recording uh, and some other resources as well. So just uh, why don't you guys test that out for me, for you all that's on here. If you see the questions area, um, this doesn't have to be a question, but could you maybe just type where you're from, put your name and where you're from, uh, city and state or country or, or whatever you'd like. And that way we'll make sure that uh, that you folks are seeing that okay. See, good morning, good morning, Frank. Uh, San Diego, hi David in San Diego. Montreal, Olivia, hello. Uh, welcome from up north. We got Maryland, uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, New York City, California, Texas, Connecticut, Georgia. Um, lots of folks on here. Thanks, guys. Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland, Michigan, Connecticut, Richmond. All right, guys. A lot of people. There's Alberta as well. So very good. I appreciate you guys doing that. So now you know how it works. As we get going, uh, when you guys ask questions, just pop those questions in there. And uh, we've got a few of us on here, so we'll try to we'll try to answer them as we go. And if we can't. As I said, we'll we'll definitely get an email out to you after that. So I hope everybody's doing okay. I know it's crazy time, so I really appreciate you all joining us right now. Um, here is uh, here's the basics. Uh, here's the team, right? This is the product management team at TextHelp. You've got Kathleen, who you'll hear from first. She looks over Read and Write. Uh, that'll be followed by Louie, who looks over Equatio, which is the math side, math and STEM solution side of things here at TextHelp. Mark looks over our newest um, addition to the product line, which is RIQ. He'll be going over that. It's uh, mainly been for Google users in the past, but he's probably got some exciting things to tell you if you are a Microsoft user as well. And then I'm Jason. Uh, I work with the guys here on all the products. Today, I'm going to specifically be covering uh, Fluency Tutor. So we'll go through all those things. And uh, and then again, just ask questions. And we really appreciate you guys being here. So having said that, Kathleen and I are going to have to do this uh, kind of quick handoff here. So be patient with me while I change presenter and uh kathleen we see your your video is on there hopefully everyone else sees awesome. that uh sees that as well the only thing that's a little tricky is it <laughs> it's showing me everyone so i'm scrolling through a few hundred people here to uh to is find you tab for panelists specifically maybe one would think but uh, i found you you're in there oh, um okay. hopefully there's not two of you uh two <laughs> kathleen's um, so right. that should be over to you now. Yep. Just getting okay. the right I'm gonna go on mute. Up here. Do it. Oh. One second here. Apparently I need to allow access and system preferences, which is new to me because I'm using the Mac for the first time here instead of the Windows machine. That's uh, great. Is that is it going to take a second to do? Yeah, why not? How about, let's Louis, let's go to Louis. Louis, are you okay with are you okay with kicking off first, Louis, and then Kathleen can get that sorted on the uh, on the Mac machine? Is that okay? Yeah, most definitely. Can you you see me and hear me okay? Yep, we can. Perfect. So give me another yep. minute to, uh, yep. to find you here on the list. There no is uh, there's Louis. So everything I said before still goes. We're just uh, going to switch the uh, order around here for a bit. So Louis, that's over to you. Yes, sir. And you can see yeah. the slide deck there. I can see you and I see the slide deck. So everyone on the call, we're just doing a thing when we're speaking, we figured we'd show the video. We're all probably in a similar circumstance to you. We're all working from home. 
Uh, so we thought we would uh, we just show that we're right there with you and uh, have the video up while uh, while we go through the slides on that one. Okay, over to you, Lee. Perfect. Thanks for the handoff. So uh, while Kathleen works through the read-write uh, permissions there, I'm going to go ahead and start a little bit out of order, but not a problem here. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, really excited to join you all. And as Jason said, you can see we're all working from home too, much like you. Um, we have a website here to share with you if you want more information about Equatio. So you're welcome to visit texthelp.com front slash Equatio. And a couple slides I wanted to go over, and then I'm just going to go right into the demo because as Jason mentioned, it's just a, a very uh, short webinar. Um, we got about 12 minutes each to cover these products. So uh, I just want to cover some frustrations that teachers often felt when students went digital and went one-to-one -one and started to look at how devices are going to be used from a math and a STEM, uh, STEM classroom. And it's fair to say that math was really left behind when compared to other subject areas. I often heard students that came to my one-to-one -one digital class that, uh, you know, when they entered their math classroom, they were told to put their devices away. And that just seemed really unfair to me. Like I wanted a solution. I wanted something uh, that can help me and my students achieve some of these things that were happening uh, in ways that students were doing creative things in other classes. I wanted that same experience for my kids uh, when I was in the classroom. So. Uh, some frustrations, common things, is that math is still done with paper and pencil. We're now finding that obviously there's a place for Equatio, and we're excited to show you some of those features today. Until now, writing equations, and especially uh, complex math expressions, was always very difficult on a computer or a mobile device, and oftentimes has, has been something that's been slow. Uh, rather than enhancing learning, we often think that technology uh, you know, it is used and it's 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 just wonderful thing, but it often created some barriers in the math classroom. So I want to introduce you to obviously Equatio. Uh, some of you might have used Equatio in the past. You might have seen it or heard us at a conference or speak to it. Uh, I'm going to go over more of the remote learning features of Equatio today. But uh, know that uh, I don't know if Jason said this in the beginning, but when you do hear from Caitlin, you will receive the slide deck for today. So you'll have access to uh, the slides for all things Equatio. So I'm just going to go over just these couple slides here, and then we're going to go live and do a demo. So let's talk real quick about what is Equatio. And Equatio is a toolbar that, it, that is accessible in multiple platforms, and it allows users to make math in a variety of different ways. In particular, uh, Equatio was founded on uh, universal design for learning, and the, those input methods that you see below allow students choice and choice in a digital classroom or in a remote learning classroom, if you will, working from home is a very great thing for students to be able to make math and to be able to experience their STEM content uh, in different ways. And we provide that with our product. So one thing to think of and this slide deck that I'm using to be fair is a Google uh, uh, extension slide deck, but I will tell you, and actually it's on my next slide that we are available in many platforms. So you can easily add equations, formulas, graphs to within all products inside the G Suite. You can type, handwrite, uh, handwrite or dictate any expression uh, audibly. And we have inside of our product a huge library of formulas, functions, and chemical compounds that are simple to complex. So a lot of times our product, in my opinion, has been mistaken for something that's only really used in higher educational math settings. And I come from a primary background and a secondary math background, uh, and I see use cases for Equatio across the board. So from kindergarten all the way through higher education, our product is uh, absolutely fantastic. So uh, this slide here talks about the platforms that we currently integrate with. So I mentioned earlier the G Suite. We work in Microsoft Word within the Windows environment. Uh, we also work on the Mac. So within Mac OS, we work inside of Word. So if you have a Mac computer and you want to open Word, you can use Equatio on that. And then finally, that bottom right corner, you may or may be familiar with it, but that is the logo for Canvas. And we do integrate and have an LTI built into that learning management system. We're actually working on other LTI integrations as we speak uh, and encourage you to kind of uh, maybe give TextHelp a follow on Twitter to keep up with some of those integrations that we hope to announce here very soon. So I'm going to have you just jump into a demo. And one thing that I think is, is important to do is kind of show you uh, the best ways to kind of use this product. And I like to tell people to go to equatio.texthelp.com. So if you want to just listen and kind of play along, so to speak, you're welcome to just kind of listen and watch me make math today. But if you'd like to open up 
equatio.texthelp.com and see this from uh, you know your perspective. If you have a license, you can sign in. If you've never been to equatio.texthelp.com, you will be asked to authenticate. Um, so if you have to go through that process, it may be best to just kind of watch me today. So when I look at my Equatio dashboard, I have over here some tabs, and I'm gonna go over those fairly quickly with you. When you think of your math spaces, I want you to think of these articles here as thumbnails that can be shared with students. So this is work that you, as a teacher or an instructional designer, can create, and you can share these out with students. And students can then, with a premium license for Equatio, can send those items back into the teacher. So this is a great, great, fantastic tool uh, for teachers to be using in the, in, the, in the current climate. So when I think of something, and I don't wanna, I don't know what everyone's math ability is in here, but uh, I was a former algebra teacher myself, so I'm gonna pull up just some, uh, for some people this may not be basic, but some basic algebra, if you will, so factoring trinomials. So let's say that I just wanna send out some practice problems for students. When I click on that thumbnail, it's gonna open up this math space. This math space here that I created these problems on, you can use any of the input methods that I spoke of before. So let's say for example, that I wanted to add another a problem to this. I could simply go to my equation editor and begin to type in things like 3x squared. Notice our prediction engine will open up and it's trying to predict, what is Louis trying to make right here? Well, I typed in 3xsq, so 3x squared plus maybe six, and I'm just making these up, uh, actually 6x, excuse me, uh, minus, I'm just making this up in my head, I'm not sure if this would even factor very well, but notice how easy it was for me to create a math expression there, even including superscripts, I can make subscripts, and I can simply come over here and insert that math. So when I do that, I can provide additional problems that simple right into the math space. I also would have the ability to go in and make math using handwriting. So notice how this problem carried over. So I could make another uh, math space question by writing something like this. Now this isn't gonna factor very well here in this particular example, but cause I'm again, just making this up in my head. So notice the handwriting tool, six X cubed, and that's not a very good six there, I'll be honest with you, minus two X minus seven. So here's another example, and I can insert that right into math space. So notice how easy it is for me to make math. I can also use the speech input tool and I can record math. So I can click on this red button and I can record myself audibly. 2x squared minus 4x equals eight. So I have 2x squared minus 4x equals eight. It listened for me to speak that math and I can then insert that math. So here's some additional problems that I made for students. And then this is really the workflow that you're gonna wanna follow if you choose to you know, use this product for remote learning. So notice up here in the top right corner, I have this share button. So I can easily click on that share button. And then this right here is gonna be the key. I have two options in my dropdown box. I have the option to make a copy for each person or I have the option to make a copy for each person and expect a response. This is the one that I want. Notice the asterisk here because this is a premium feature. I can click on this and it'll give you the notation here. And what it's going to do, it's going to generate and create this unique URL. So we're gonna make this URL for you. And this is the great part here is I can easily copy this to my clipboard and I can take this URL and I can go put it anywhere that I want. I can put it inside of Canvas, for example. I could push it out through another ed tech tool if I want. However, I wanna get this URL to my students when they're at home learning, that's how I need to use this URL. I just need to get it to them however I share things with my students. It could be an email. Or notice the integration we have with Classroom. So this is really impactful. Lots of Google users out there. Google Classroom, I can watch how easy it is to import this right into Classroom. So I can click here. I can choose this demo class and click, and I can choose the action. And what I wanna do is create an assignment for my students. 
So I can create that assignment, click go, and then I can provide, uh, I'm just gonna put demo here to save time. And then if you're familiar with Classroom, you know that you can pick a due date. So I can come here in my calendar, maybe I wanna give them till next Tuesday to complete. And it's just as simple as that. You can even differentiate your assignments right in Classroom, but here's that math space. And when I assign it to my students, it'll go right in as a streamed assignment. So students will have the ability to go and view that assignment in that classroom stream. The other thing that's really great is, remember how I said, not all of you are going to be classroom users, right? So one thing that's really great to demo here is I have the ability to change users. So now that I've shown you how a teacher would share that math space, it's important to have you see what that looks like then from the student perspective. So I would go into my browser window and the student is going to open that URL. However you got that URL to them, this is how it's going to appear. So I'm going to open or click on that URL, however it's shared, and I want you to look. This is now the student facing side of this math space. Now you might look at this and go, well, that looks just like the teacher side. It is, however, look up here at this button. This button allows the student to submit this work back to the teacher. So what's really neat here is the students then are going to be able to use all these input methods to create their math. One thing I didn't show is inside of Equatio is you have all sorts of shapes and different smart shapes so students can utilize all the different things that they want. So we have coins, we have pentominoes, we have spheres, all sorts of geometry, Venn diagrams, algebra tiles, so all these different tools within Equatio and STEM items here that they can use to make or create their math. So just because we don't have tons of time, I'm going to go and annotate on this very quickly. I'm just gonna put hi. You don't really wanna watch me factor this trinomial, do you? Uh, and I'm gonna send this back to the teacher. So the teacher, remember, is working remotely at home. I, the student right here in front of you, is going to submit this back to the teacher. So the student is going to see a congratulations type message. It's gonna say, congratulations, you shared this back to your teacher. Now, I need to go back to my teacher account and watch this. Remember, we started right here, everybody, and look at all these math spaces that I have in here. Let me refresh this, because I have plenty more than what you currently saw. So all different ways that you can create math spaces. Here's Halloween themed activities, um, we have students, you know, I have a seven-year-old son who's learning time literally right out in the other room as I speak. And this is something that he could do. He could take the arrows and put the time on the clock. We have all sorts of pie activities that I've created. So yes, I will be honest with you, it's going to take some time to create some of these math spaces, but hopefully your district or your school will give you some of that time to create these activities that can then be shared to students. What's important here is this tab here. Now, I'm gonna go and show you where that assignment went that that student sent me. I'm gonna click on assignments, and I know I'm almost out of time here. Look right here under factoring the trinomials, and look, I got a notification that someone submitted this to me. So when I click on this, take a look, and that's me, that's my name, time stamped, and I can go into this math space, and I can provide on the spot feedback right here to the student. So I would have the ability to go in and type in text such as, uh, well, for me, you did not follow directions. Uh, obviously the directions were not to send your message to the teacher saying hi. So then I could then insert that and I could then send this back to the student. The student would then be given the opportunity to correct their work and they could then submit it back to the teacher. So this is one great way that you can utilize Equatio in a remote learning setting. Uh, Jason, I believe I'm out of time. Uh, if you can turn your mic on and I, I can turn it back to Kathleen or if-, if uh, Yeah, you if you can switch over, I think Kathleen's good to go. If you can make her the presenter and she yep. can share her screen, that's great. And uh, Louie, that's really good. Um, we've got more questions than ever, I think, about math and digitally and how do we do this remotely. So I just wanted to take a second to plug the thing that you and Ryan are going to do. Um, right. So Louie and our, our head developer over at Quasio are going to start doing these digital math Monday uh, kind of things at 11 a.m. Eastern that you can turn in, you, you can turn in live for, or you can just see the recording later. It'll be on YouTube. 
Uh, but you, if you're on Twitter, you can just do hashtag explore Equatio, I think is the most recent thing. Uh, and, and submit any questions that you have there. We'll, of course, answer the questions, but then Louie and Ryan will be uh, will be going through some of those questions live so you can learn more about how to teach math digitally with Equatio. Yeah, real quick, Jason, I think it was Ask Equatio hashtag. Yeah, it's been updated. Uh, it's updated oh, to okay. Explore. Okay. Uh, My bad. Changing times, Louie. Okay. <laughs> it's everything <laughs> changing fast. <laughs> um, right, so that's good. Kathleen, we see you and see your screen, so you're good to go. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> nothing like a little technology hiccup to really uh, energize me this morning. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're going to switch gears now um, and talk a little bit about read and write. Um, so for those of you on the call who are familiar with read and write already, which may be a lot of you, um, get my next slide up here. So we know that the read and write toolbar supports, you know, students in a whole variety of ways. Um, it provides a lot of really powerful literacy and study supports, um, and especially in remote learning scenarios. These can be especially helpful for students who you know, may not have the same access to their teacher or to other resources that they would normally have when they're physically in the classroom. The tools on the Read and Write toolbar can really give them the independence to you know, do the reading comprehension and writing and independent research that they need to be doing. Um, but what I actually wanna focus on more specifically today is kind of similar to the workflow that Lily showed with Equatio. Um, and this is how you can use read and write to do something that we probably kind of take for granted when we're physically in the classroom. And that is the whole workflow of assigning something to a student, a student being able to complete it digitally, turn it in, and then the teacher being able to review and provide real-time feedback. So when it comes to you know, non-math assignments, um, read and write can really help accomplish that. And that is all done through the Textel PDF reader. So I wanna focus just on the PDF reader side of things today. Um, and we'll kind of walk through this whole process of using read and write to get an assignment in digital format, to have the student complete that assignment and then submit it to the teacher. And then the teacher can review their work again, all digitally, and then provide a grade, provide feedback, um, or you know, return to the student for revisions, and then be able to kind of keep that um, workflow going with with real-time feedback and you know things that might otherwise be challenging in remote learning situations. Um, so with that being said, let's kind of start looking at each piece of this cycle here and how read and write can be used um, to accomplish it. So we'll start with getting an assignment in digital form. Um, so if many of you may be used to you know handing out paper worksheets or um, you know reading through textbook chapters, so suddenly we need a way to get these in a digital format. So most of the time, our go-to would be to get it in PDF format. Um, but I wanna bring your attention to some kind of important aspects of PDFs that are really important, especially if you're gonna be using a tool like Read and Write. And that is you wanna make sure that that PDF is readable or accessible, as opposed to being image-based. So to give you a quick little tutorial on how this works, Let's say I have scanned a page from a textbook and this is what something I want to share with my students to have them read and annotate. So you can see in this GIF here, I can't actually select any of the text that's on that PDF. All I can kind of do is, you know, trace kind of a square around it or like select the whole image. So this is a PDF that is not going to be very useful if students want to use tools like read and write to read the text or to look up words. So let's compare that to this next image here. Same PDF, but now I can actually select individual text. I can get as granular as a word or a sentence. So this is the type of PDF that students are gonna need in order to use tools like Read and Write to interact with it. So we don't wanna stick with those image-based PDFs that are just like a picture or, or a quick scan with a scanner. We wanna make sure that those PDFs have been OCR'd, which is optical character recognition, um, and, and are now accessible or readable. So um, built into Read and Write, there are a couple of different ways that you can take a, a picture or an image-based PDF and make it readable or accessible. One of those is Snapverter. So Snapverter is an add-on to Read and Write that's you know, in the Chrome store. It allows you to snap a picture of a paper in front of you, whether that's you know, a textbook printout of a chapter or a worksheet, something along those lines. You can actually snap a picture of it with your phone 
and then upload it into your Snapherder folder in Google Drive. And that will spit out an accessible, readable version of that PDF that you can then share with students or you know, distribute it however you want to. So that's a really easy way to make content accessible using um, one of the text help tools. The other option is actually built into the desktop version of Read and Write. So, you know, if you have a Read and Write license and you're used to using the Google version, you do also have access to Read and Write for Windows and Read and Write for Mac. And those have a built-in scanning tool inside them that allows you to basically, if you have a PDF already saved on your computer, you can drag it right into that scanning window and then basically convert it into an accessible version of that PDF and save it. So that's built right into your Read and Write toolbar that you have access to. So that's kind of the first step of that process, actually getting the PDF in accessible or, or readable digital format. So the next piece goes into actually distributing that PDF to your students, having them fill it out, turn it in. Um, so for that, I'm gonna hop out of my slides here and we'll take a look at how this workflow works really nicely with Google Classroom. Um, so I wanna show you a lot of this in Classroom just for the sake of time. But keep in mind that this sort of workflow can also work really well in other LMSs. Um, and even just as simple as sharing a PDF with students through Google Drive or through OneDrive can accomplish this as well. Um, so again, we'll, we'll focus on Classroom here. So um, this is my teacher account that I use for Google Classroom. So let's say I want to create an assignment out of this um, grammar worksheet that I have in my drive. So the first thing I did was run it through Snapferder to make sure that the text is readable for my students. So once I have this opened up in the text help PDF reader, I'm gonna see an option on the right side of the toolbar that will allow me to um, assign that work to my student. So I have this little button here that integrates with Google Classroom. So when I click on that, it's gonna show me those kind of standard um, classroom prompts that allow me to create an assignment. So I'm gonna pick which class I wanna use. Um, we'll say create assignment. I can give it a name, um, add any additional instructions. The key thing here to remember is you want to choose the option where each student gets their own copy. And this is gonna allow each student to fill out their worksheet with read and write and not have to worry about, you know, everyone's responses being right on top of each other if it was the same PDF. So now I just assign that out to my student. And once that has been assigned, um, now we'll switch to my student account. So now we're looking at the student side of things. Um, I go into my class to see if my teacher has assigned me any work. And I can see here that she has posted a new assignment. And now because I also have Read and Write installed and I have the Text Help PDF Reader installed, when I click on this work to fill it out, it can be opened automatically in the Text Help PDF Reader. So now as a student, I have access to all these different features um, that I can use both for you know, reading and understanding the text and also for you know, filling out the work. So I'll just take a minute here to, to load apparently, I'm running a little slow, I guess. Try refreshing this. So I should see the PDF load, and then I'll have access to things along the top here, like text-to-speech. So I can use the hover speech feature to read that PDF aloud. Um, I can, there we go. So let's say I want to you know, read the instructions. Um, all I have to do is click anywhere in the text For each sentence, and I can hear that read aloud. Um, I also have these really great annotation tools that allow me to actually write on top of the PDF. So these would be what I would use to actually you know, submit my responses. So the typewriter tool here is kind of the most straightforward one. I click wherever I want to place the annotation and then I can add my response. Um, and note here, I do have access to word prediction and dictation here as well. So if I need the, the writing supports, I have access to those while I'm doing my work. Um, then there's also other different you know, types of annotation tools. So these instructions say, draw a box around the subject. So I can select my rectangle here, draw a box. 
And then it also says to highlight the verb of the sentence. So I'm gonna highlight that word goes, come up here and choose one of my highlighter colors. So I can do that to you know, complete this whole worksheet. And then this turn it in button in the top, at the top is gonna allow me to submit that assignment right to my teacher via classroom. So I hit that final turn it in button. And now that has been turned over to my teacher for them to review. So last little uh, switcheroo here, we'll go back to my teacher account, go into Google Classroom. And I will be able to see that my student has submitted that work. So I see one has been turned in. Now notice when I open this up, it's gonna open in the standard um, classroom grading window. And now I will also actually be able to see that student's work embedded right in the window. So it's not like I have to go open it up in a separate tab in order to see those annotations. As long as I have that Textile PDF reader installed, I'll be able to review their work right in the classroom window. So we can see their annotation and their um, highlights and all those things loaded right up. So now I can go ahead, give the student a grade, um, return it to them, all those things are possible. Um, so that's kind of a, a whirlwind look at how that works in classroom. We have a very similar integration um, that we're just getting um, released. We've got one little update to do, and then this is going to work in Schoology LMS as well. Um, and it can also really be customized to any LMS. As long as you have the ability to open a PDF um, on the web, you'll be able to open it up with the Textile PDF Reader and give students the ability to, to fill it out, and then you'll have the ability to review their work. Um, so that is a very quick look at one piece of read and write and definitely I would encourage you to um, review the resources and things that we're going to share because there are lots of other ways that read and write can be used um, for remote learning. So for now, I think I will be ready to switch it over to Mark. Yep, let's write on uh, tons of questions pouring in here, Kathleen. So uh, okay. you'll, have plenty to, you'll have plenty to respond to after you hand that off to, uh, after you hand that off to Mark there. Yes. All right, so. Mark, you're all set. I am. Um, oh, wow, I do have to look through the whole list of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, I think that just went to you, Mark. Yep, hold on one oh. second. There we go. Uh, you guys see the right cue? Are we up for the right thing to yep. show? Great. Yep. Um, you. So I will, uh, thanks, Kathleen, first of all. I will. Uh, follow suit and try to do this as quickly as I can uh, for everybody. Oops, Ooh, there we go. Uh, a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the philosophies that guide RIQ I think are important even or even more so uh, in a remote learning scenario. Uh, then we'll talk about RIQ for remote learning, uh, what teachers can do and what students can do. Um, so we looked at sort of the overall picture of student writing and this won't really be a surprise to anybody, but student writing generally isn't very good. This comes from the National Report Card from a couple years ago. Um, also, kids tend not to like writing as an activity. So we sort of took those two things um, and, and thought about what we could do to make student writing better. Um, this applies for a classroom, but certainly also applies when kids are not in your classroom. Um, there are two things that seem to drive student writing to, to be better when you look at all the research. The major thing is motivation. Uh, kids need to be motivated um, to write more. Uh, the other thing that makes student writing better is writing more. If you look up um, what makes student writing better on uh, Google, if you Google search it, you get about 30 trillion responses. Um, I'll boil the research down to two things. They need to be motivated and they need to practice. It's like any other skill. Um, part of our motivation uh, comes from some research we did into video games. Um, video games, uh, if you look at research on video games, this, is, this was really interesting to me. Video games are addictive to kids partially because of the immediate feedback they get. So a student uh, or a, a, a kid <laughs> sitting at home playing a video game, they fight a big monster, they lose to the big monster. Three minutes later, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're fighting the big monster again, and they know what they did wrong the first time. That gives them so much motivation. They might have to do it a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, whatever time, but
but they get that immediate feedback. They know immediately what they did wrong and immediately they have an idea of something to try next. With writing, we ask kids to wait two or three days, two or three weeks, maybe longer. Um, and that's be not because we're lazy, um, but it takes a long time to grade student writing. So we wanted to know if we could speed up that feedback process. So one of the things that we do to help you guys, and especially in a remote learning situation, is speed up that feedback. It makes the feedback more meaningful. Um, it's going to boost their motivation. We're also gonna give you ways to track progress. This is gonna be especially important if kids are out for weeks or months, if they're gonna be at home, it's gonna be a lot harder to track their progress in terms of what you see in the classroom. You're only gonna see a final product um, and we're gonna give you some ways to, to track that a little bit easier uh, using some data that's, that we can pull from the writing. Uh, you'll see where they need extra help, where they excel. You'll be able to uh, differentiate your instruction even from your house. <laughs> uh, we also want to reduce some of the subjectivity. Part of the subjectivity is because we're human. Um, when we grade papers, um, we've got 100 papers to grade. And when you're on your 87th paper out of 100 and you've read the same thing about To Kill a Mockingbird 4,700 times, you miss some stuff. Um, AI can, can remove some of the bias, it can compensate for some fatigue, uh, and make the whole thing a little bit uh, less subjective. Uh, I don't know why that's going through again. There we go. Um, these are links that you guys will have on feedback. Uh, so when we make the uh, when we make this deck available to anybody that uh, registered for the webinar, um, there's some really good research here on timely feedback and what it means to kids, uh, and some uh, some research on exactly what is timely feedback and what um, what really means the most uh, for students. So that being said, that sort of quick review of the philosophy, I'm just gonna jump right into a demo. This is a regular Google Doc uh, that I typed up. You may recognize some of the writing. Um, the RIQ icon is up here in the top right of the screen. And this is the sidebar. As soon as you open the sidebar, spelling, grammar, punctuation are all done and marked in the document. If there's anything that we missed, um, that our check it service, excuse me, missed, um, you can just click on a word. So if we think Tuesday is spelled wrong, I can just click on it and mark it as an error. Uh, if I think Dursley's is spelled correctly, I don't wanna have to click ignore for every one of those. I can just click ignore all, and that's gonna get updated right away in the sidebar. Accuracy is based on a uh, correct word sequence. So any two words in a row that doesn't, that does, that do not, excuse me, have an error, uh, is considered a correct word sequence. Looks like we missed a punctuation error up there. I'm just gonna mark that as a punctuation error. Anytime you change an error or mark an error, it goes into our database. We update the rules. We've added like 3000 grammar rules in the last few years because English is really hard. Uh, and, and we work to make the product better based on the feedback that you give us immediately. So please, if you see that we missed something, mark it. Um, we'll miss punctuation errors here and there. Uh, but we're getting much better at it. It's also really easy to fix it uh, while you're reading through it. One of the things I like to remind teachers is that we're not removing you um, from the process. We are, uh, we're just speeding up the process. We're not removing you from it. So as I move down here, and I'll come back up to the top, but as I move down here, uh, word count, pretty obvious, a vocabulary maturity. Uh, there's more of an explanation for this in uh, a couple of the videos that we have on our YouTube playlist on how we get to the vocabulary maturity measure and time on task. So time on task is really important. Uh, when I first started, I, I thought we'd get a lot of negative reaction to this, but teachers actually really like it. Time on task only measures um, the amount of time that a student has spent editing or writing in the document. So if they come in, they write a sentence, they leave the doc open, they run around school or right now in their house, um, they go outside, they play with their friends, they come back, they write another sentence, that's only two minutes of time on task. So when somebody comes up to you at the end of the period or after two days and it's like, oh, Mr. Schwartz, I worked on this so hard, but all I could write was two sentences, hmm, you didn't work on it that hard. Um, so once I check over all of this, that's all. that can also be used, by the way, as sort of a quick, uh, plagiarism checker. If you've got three pages of writing and only two minutes of time on task, you may want to ask some questions. Um, so once I go over all this and this looks good, I'm going to select, uh, I'm going to make sure the grade is correct. And then I'm going to select my rubric. 
Uh, I can skip the rubric with, uh, if I want. There are three built-in rubrics that we have, narrative, informative, and opinion. And then uh, these are custom rubrics, and I'll, I'll show you about making custom rubrics in a minute. For this, I'm gonna choose narrative because it's a narrative. I'm gonna continue to rubric. For our built-in rubrics, we have four areas of focus and then four grade levels. This is really my favorite part uh, of the whole thing because I hated doing rubrics. I hated filling them out. I hated having to do the math. I really like how easy this is. So whether it's a built-in or a custom rubric that you make, um, for each area of criteria, you can just click the plus sign to expand it out if you wanna remind yourself sort of what that is. Most of the time when you read through these, you'll know, you know, the focus for this is at grade level. The organization for this essay is approaching grade level. Um, the narrative techniques, well, it is J.K. Rowling, so I'll say that it's above grade level. Language is probably also above grade level. Um, and I'm just doing this quick. You guys can uh, certainly take your time and go through all of these. Um, then I get to the summary screen. I'll come back up to the top. Down here, you get the rubric score. Uh, <laughs> done for me. Man, I really appreciate that. Uh, with these nice visualizations. Um, up here, we have all of the uh, data that we looked at earlier. The RIQ score is a metric that we've come up with um, to, to sort of measure, uh, is another measure, a, an objective measure, sorry, a barometer, if you will, of your student writing. Um, one RIQ score doesn't do you a lot of good. The key to the RIQ score is how you uh, use the, the tracking measure over time, and you want to see that RIQ score going up. The RIQ score is based on a zero to 400 scale. It takes into account four things. How much is written there, the word count, what the vocabulary maturity is, how much time it took, and how accurate it is. Those four things go into an algorithm. It spits out a RIQ score. This one is really low for two reasons. One, there's a lot of errors for not a lot of writing. Um, also, the time on task is really high. I'm at almost three hours for four paragraphs because I use this document all the time. Um, if this were more normal, you would see a more normal uh, RIQ score. I really probably need to use a new document. Um, you can also put some feedback in here. So I'll say great story, JK. Oops, J-I-K apparently. Um, also, I like to remind people this is a regular Google Doc. So if you wanna put regular comments in as you go through, you can certainly do that. Once I check over the feedback, I check over all this, Everything we've seen up until this point is teacher only. I'm now gonna save the score, document's been scored, and I'm gonna insert this image into the document itself. The next time the student opens the doc, this is what they're gonna see. Um, they will get this whole image with all of the things that we just looked at. It's taking a minute, there you go. So that's the, the feedback image that they'll get. So they'll get the summary, the RIQ score, the rubric score. Um, I do think it's important to talk to your students about the RIQ score, also the vocabulary measure and how that gets uh, calculated because that tends to be a little bit low or, or lower than people think. Um, in the dashboard, if I go to riq.texthelp.com, I can import my Google classes. If I do that, it will preload, pre-populate all my student names. Um, you can also go to a full student list if you wanna look at all your students, you see all of their data. Um, and then when you go into any student, this is, this is really the power of RIQ in here. You get a full list of uh, a history of scored docs. You can jump back into any of the docs by just clicking on them. You're gonna get average metrics here, average RIQ score and average rubric score. In this uh, pane, in this area, um, this is where you can really track progress. So like I said, one RIQ score doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information. Um, but if you track it over time, that really gives you a better idea of their trend. You can do the same for vocabulary age uh, and also accuracy. Those orange lines you see for RIQ score and vocabulary age are national norms that we've come up with um, that allow you to track student data over time. Um, I'm just gonna jump back over here for one second. Uh, I'm gonna switch that over to student view. Um, and while that happens, I just wanna jump back to, um, to our deck here really quick. Um, I wanna talk about the student experience in RIQ and how you can use this uh, in addition to just having your kids send you any writing while you're sitting at home. Um, so how do we help students improve their own writing? 
um, student-centered. We're going to put them in charge of their learning. We're going to give them some, some nudges and badges to encourage more writing, which I'll talk about, uh, and reward them for writing accomplishments. Uh, also give them some quantitative measures. So we also talk about SMART goals. These are some of those SMART goals to track their improvement. Um, writing bursts, which is what I'm going to talk about in a second, is a measure of writing fluency. This is a thing we don't really get to measure very often. We can measure uh, reading fluency all the time, but writing fluency is a little bit different. And we do that through some nudges. If you're unaware of nudge psychology, I really recommend you check out this book. Um, it'll tell you a lot about uh, Fitbits and uh, retirement accounts and how we nudge people into making better decisions. Um, this is what we call the, the constellation of a writer's concern. And it, it's, a, it's a really uh, simplified version of it. But burst writing comes in this part. And burst writing is how much writing you do before a two second pause. So you think about the thing and then you write it. Um, and then you have to pause. Kids get trapped in this area. Kids sort of stop in this area. Um, they think about their spelling, their grammar, their punctuation. We don't want them to think about any of that. We just want them to write in bursts. Um, so if I go back over now, this is our burst meter down here. And if I scroll to the bottom of this doc, you'll see down here as I start typing, you'll see the burst meter go up. Uh, when I pause for two seconds, it will reset. I can't talk and type at the same time. So as that happens, you see that my best burst for the day is 15 words. I, I have one total burst. I haven't hit any academic keywords. Um, you can see we have a blog post on that if you want to look at what the academic keywords are. When I expand this out, I can uh, track my bursts for the day, for the week, um, for the month, and for the year. This is really helpful for kids to see how much writing they've really done. Um, so in the last month, I've written 8,900 words. My best burst was 67 words. Um, it's pretty motivating for kids to be able to see that. The other thing in the student view is that whole, um, this image that we inserted before is really nice. But if I'm in a document that, that has some feedback, I can just click on feedback, you have feedback. I can go to great story, I, I'm sorry, I see the feedback that I wrote, all of the stats that we saw earlier. And then when I scroll down to the rubric, they get a little bit more. So for this one, it was approaching grade level. They can see what that is. To see what grade level is, or above grade level, sorry, just scroll over that. So they got grade level for this. I'm sorry, this is above grade level. Um, for here, it was approaching grade level. They can just scroll over the other things to see what it is that they need to aim for. So all of that criteria is in there. The one last thing I wanna show everybody is rubrics. Uh, in the dashboard, you can create rubrics. Um, you can share them out. So if I just go to create rubric, I can add columns, I can add rows, the rubric title, I'll assign grades to them. You can assign as many grades as you want. Um, and then once I'm finished with that, I can share the rubric out. So if I just go to that three dot menu, I can share this. So now anybody else in my department or my district or wherever that's also doing something on the Crucible, I copy that link, I send that to them, they open it up in rubrics. Uh, in their dashboard, I'm sorry, and any rubric that's been shared with me will come up in here also. Um, we have a separate video on how to create and use rubrics. I recommend you see that. Um, and that will pretty much cover everything. What I, oh, one more thing, I'm sorry. Um, if I go to achievements in here for the student view, this is a thing you can really use for remote learning. Um, kids can get badges, our student can get badges for increasing their burst length, increasing their keywords in science, math, uh, or English. Um, and then for writing words, um, for writing total words, um, they'll get another badge that is the same as whatever. This is the Sound of Thunder um, or Old Man in the Sea. So you can actually give kids assignments to increase their badges or maybe get a certain number of badges before they return to school. Um, Jason, I am over my time. Um, and I will switch over to you if you are ready. Um, thanks everybody. And certainly any questions, please let me know. Um, and I'm happy to answer them. All right, good stuff, Mark. Thank you. Saw your sport in the text help shirt. Very good. I am. Brandon. Same here. Yep. 
Uh, right. Okay. So I've lost my slide deck. Just a second. Let me see where the uh, where my screen went. Right, you guys can see my screen, is that right? Yep. Okay, thank you. For some reason, when I turn my camera on, it makes my screen go away. So, um, okay, so let's take a look at uh, at Fluency Tutor uh, for Google here. And uh, sorry, I've really messed up the whole webcam thing. I'm just gonna have to do it without for a minute until I get that sorted. Uh, so Fluency Tutor is one of my favorite tools when I think about remote learning, because when I was thinking about the scenario, and uh, I have a daughter here at home, and uh, I sometimes think about, you know, how are you going to replace that time spent reading in the classroom where you're listening to students read and giving them feedback? Um, how can parents get involved? All that sort of thing. And that's where Fluency Tutor comes into play. Uh, so when I think about Fluency Tutor, you know, first I always think, well, well, what is reading fluency? And if you really break reading fluency down, it's the ability to read quickly, accurately, and with expression. And this is nothing new. There's actually a measure for that. It's measured in words correct per minute. There's been a lot of work done in the past where you can look at individual grade levels of students, um, what time of the year it is, and you can see what their words correct per minute should be if they're at the 50 per, 50th percentile uh, for their grade or the 75th percentile or something like that. Um, so, so we know there's already a measure for this, words correct per minute for fluency. And then the question comes, well, how, how do we teach students to read fluently? Uh, how do we teach reading fluency in class? And really, it's not changed much over, over the years, over the decades, really. Uh, it's typically been done with a, with a stopwatch or a timer of some sort, right, to where students read and they read for a minute. It's a really kind of weird, uncomfortable situation where their teacher's sitting across from the student, uh, the student's reading uh, a, a passage, and the teacher is going on, there's a stopwatch for a minute, and they're marking errors as the student goes along. A little bit of a tedious thing as well, because if a student makes an error, you've got to go and mark that error. But while you're marking the error, they're continuing to read. So it's kind of a hard thing to do. Then you got to calculate all that stuff up, add it in a running records log, track progress over time, and that's how you kind of tell the students are getting better at reading fluency or not. That's a bit of a pain. Fluency Tutor exists to make that a little easier. If you're not familiar with Fluency Tutor, it's a, it's, it's a Google app, so you know, if you go to the Chrome Web Store, for example, there are, uh, there's, there's extensions, which is what Read and Write is, um, what RIQ is, that's what Equatio is, and the Google version anyways. But Fluency Tutor is more of, of a web app, so if you have a Chromebook, you can get it from the App Store. If not, you can go right to our website. Uh, it'll just open up in the web. I'm getting ready to show it to you in a moment. Uh, I'm on a Mac. It'll work on a PC. All you need is the Chrome browser. And really, it improves confidence when reading aloud kind of replicates that whole running record process, except without the uncomfortableness of a teacher and student kind of sitting across from each other and marking errors along the way. It's really good to support struggling readers and English language learners because you can listen and give them very specific feedback. Mark already covered the importance of feedback. It's uh, Google Drive and Google Classroom friendly. So I will say that this is a Google app. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's not the Microsoft equivalent of it at the moment. And it does allow for, uh, for that real-time feedback and uh, there's some interesting things around passages that I'll show you here as well, but there's basically roughly 500 reading passages built in, comprehension questions that you can share with students, allow them to use those to practice reading aloud. But there's also ways that you can create your own passages. Um, you can go to websites and create passages from websites, things like that as well. So really an unlimited amount of content that you can create or choose from to share with students. I'm trying to keep this quick because I am cognizant of time. Uh, we may be running over just a couple of minutes here, but uh, but I'll go through it as quick as I can. So what you see here uh, is a Fluency Tutor dashboard. And the way you get to Fluency Tutor is, you know, it's fluency.texthelp.com. Again, you can get it from the Chrome Web Store. If you're on a Chromebook, you can get it directly from our website. You're going to be getting an email with all this stuff following up. So uh, don't worry too much about remembering that at the moment. When you first log in, you're going to be asked if you're a teacher or a student. If you're a teacher, it's going to take you into the Fluency Tutor dashboard. You'll notice some similarities across all of our dashboards, whether it's MathSpace or RyCube or, in this case, Fluency Tutor. Now, the default place that it takes you to is your list of students. Well, if this is your first time using Fluency Tutor, you're not going to have a list of students, and that's okay. You can see that I have a personal account that I use. That's a student. Chloe is my daughter. 
Uh, I occasionally have her read some stuff for me to uh, to help out for demo purposes and I have some other folks listed here as, as well. So those are my students. To get started with Fluency Tutor, really you just want to go down to, to share a passage. And when I click share a passage, it will take me to the screen to show all the passages that are in Fluency Tutor. As I mentioned, there's around 500 passages there. You can sort these by Lexile level, if you're familiar with Lexile level, or reading age, or word count, any way you'd like. So if I want to look for the most complicated content, I can just sort by Lexile level, and you see I have up to uh, 1180 is the highest one. That's uh, around Amelia Earhart, but there's also uh, plenty more that I can choose from for there. If I'm interested in seeing more about this passage before I share it out with my student, or there's a classroom integration here as well, the same with other products, so I could share a passage out with my entire class through Google Classroom if I would like. But I can click on it, I can see the content, see if that matches about the area that, that's, that the students are reading at. I can also look at the comprehension questions that come along with it. There are settings before I share it. If I want to, I can require that the student answer comprehension questions. By default, when a student opens a passage, their support tools, real similar to read and write. You can have text to speech and talking dictionaries and that sort of stuff to help the student along. In general, that's a great idea. But if you're really trying to assess reading fluency with no support, you could choose to disable having those support tools available. Uh, we call that a cold read. So you can set all these options, including the voice and translation, all that kind of stuff ahead of time if you'd like, or just leave the default settings. When you're ready, you can then share that passage with a student. You can do it one of two ways. I don't have a Google Classroom set up, so I'm just going to share it through Google Drive. Here I can share it with a group of students or an individual student. If I just share it with uh, myself, my personal email, I can hit send, and uh, and that'll go away and be sent, and I'll get a notification as a, as a student that a passage is ready. So to see what this looks like from a student end, uh, I'm just going to switch over from a student account to a student account real quick. You can do this as a teacher as well. It's quite handy to, to, to mess with this. Uh, yourself a bit so you can see what students see. Uh, the students also have a dashboard and it shows their history, the scores they receive, their feedback, all that sort of stuff. So if I want to go back and open a, uh, a recording or open a passage from before, here's one on dream or reality, uh, extreme action heroes, Martin Luther King, a lot of these passages that I can open up. And that will take us to see the, uh, it'll take us to see the student view. So this is what a student sees. Uh, they're going to see the passage when they first open it. They're then able to use any of our support tools. So text to speech, for example. On August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King, Jr. Ah, so Jr. Said so Jr. But you guys get the uh, you guys get the point that it'll go through and read that out loud. There's a dictionary, so I can go and look up any words in the in the dictionary. So maybe inspiring, for example. Uh, gives me definitions. I can have those definitions read aloud. If I wanted to click on a word and choose the picture dictionary, if there are any pictures, it will show pictures related to that. Uh, so a lot of different things that you can do there. You can use the translator. You can change the reading speed. You can change the voice. And then when, re when ready, students go to record. And they simply hit start recording and they can read along on the, their reading then gets passed back to the teacher. So to show you what that would look like, uh, again, I've used my daughter here to help me out with this. So if I were to go, uh, I'm just going to switch back to teacher view. Just found that Martin is my teacher. Uh, so I'm going to go back to a teacher. This is what you see when you first start up. There's a little intro video, all those sort of things. And it will take me back to my Fluency Tutor dashboard. Now I'm going to click on Chloe. And from here, uh, I can see these are some things that she read just yesterday. So uh, this was her homework last night to help me out with this. And there's a couple of things I can do. I'll get a notification anytime Chloe submits something. Um, and now I can click on it. And there's two ways you can score this. I can just do a quick listen if I would like and give a thumbs up or ask her to try it again. But the real power comes from scoring the passage. And when I score the passage, I open it up, and uh, here is the reading, and I can hit play, and this will play uh, Chloe reading it. This modern world of science and invention is a particular interest to women. The last 
So I can play this all the way through. She's read for 42 seconds uh, on it. and uh, But I just go through and I mark any time that she made an error. And this is what I like about it that I said was hard earlier if you're doing this in person is it's, it's really difficult uh, to mark an error while a student keeps, continues reading. But here, as soon as I click on a word, it pauses. Um, I can go then and, uh, and, and mark any kind of error that was. Why is the women have been more affected by Atlantic Horizon than those of any other group? Profound and stirring as have so I can go through that and uh, she's actually doing quite good just reading pretty fast here so uh, so but I could go through and mark any errors that I uh, that I found and once done and you can see it automatically calculates those er errors for me as I mark them it automatically gives me a words correct per minute score it uh, self correction is a little bit different so if, if she were to make a mistake and correct it you mark that it's not like counted against them or anything when you're done when you're done, you would save scoring and it gives you a rubric to look at. So I can say, how was her expression? Uh, and I can say she had some expression. The phrasing was a bit of a mixture. Uh, the smoothness was uh, generally smooth on the pace. Uh, it was, um, well, it was pretty fast, right? Uh, and so I can give that, say, nice work. Slow it down a bit. Next time and hit finish. And now she'll get that feedback in her dashboard. So basically what you have now with Fluency Tutor is you have a way that you're going to be able to go and find passages, share those passages with students. They're going to be able to open those up. Uh, you could, We've got plenty of videos that show, so parents want to help out with as they can. Students can open it up, practice reading. That's going to immediately get sent back to you, and you're going to be able to uh, you're going to be able to listen and give them feedback. And then that's automatically going to track progress over time. So what I've shown you here is how you can do that within Fluency Tutor, but you can also, uh, one of the passages, for example, that I shared, I should go back to Chloe here, uh, you can also get content from the web. So if I go to share passage, um, you can also create content. So you can create your own content or copy and paste content. We have a Chrome extension to where you can grab content from the web. So for example, she was doing some homework the other day, and uh, I was able to take some of the homework she was doing and turn it into a reading passage for her to uh, for her to look at so that's what this why do we have skin passages um, so i'll show you that and this just this is information directly that i was able to uh, use the fluency tutor extension and just create more reading content from the web that she was able to practice with uh, so that's fluency tutor i i realize i've i've flown through this but uh it's just we're out of time on that and i wanted to give people a brief overview of how it works the good news is i should say great news is if you're interested in trying fluency tutor uh, because of these, the times that we're in, Fluency Tutor is now completely free for everyone for the rest of the school year. So I'd urge you to go to our website at textile.com, find Fluency Tutor as the product. You can install it directly from there, and it'll be automatic. You don't have to do anything. You'll just have free access for the for the remainder of the year on that. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. I'll pop in and see what questions may have come up. Past that, I just uh, because we're out of time, I want to go back into slideshow mode and show you i've up you will get the slide deck but i've updated the slide deck with um with our oh kathleen sorry i need you to add your twitter account um i, I added it to the one that's at the beginning of the deck <laughs> sorry i made a copy of it so i'll fix that <laughs> anyways you folks will get a uh you folks will get a, a copy of the slide deck and it has uh, it has all of our emails and it has our twitter account so you can find us on twitter tag us ask us questions all those sort of things and in addition Caitlin, are you on here to tell folks uh, how this is going to work from here? Sure. Um, should we take a few extra minutes to see if there's any other questions we'd like to answer that have come through the chat let's window? Do two, let's do two things, if that's okay. See, since we're since we're over the time, can can you tell them what's going on here? And if they have to hop off, they'll know. And then we'll hang out for an extra few minutes to answer questions for anybody that's available. Sure, no problem. Uh, so tomorrow you'll receive an email. Uh, with some follow-up resources, including a link to this webinar recording, the slides that Jason mentioned, and some additional links um, that will help guide you to try these products. Uh, so be sure to uh, look out for that tomorrow. And I also wanted to mention that this webinar will be the first in a series that we're hoping to offer this spring all around remote learning. So uh, just look out for more details on those sessions coming soon. Perfect. Um, thank you, Caitlin. So all that stuff's automatic. You guys don't have to do anything. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the uh, to the question slide here. Um, Caitlin, do you have a few do you want to ask? And 
whatever product it's related to, uh, one of those will answer? I do. Um, so the first one around Fluency Tutor, um, the question was, can students practice reading uh, even if a teacher doesn't assign a passage? Sure, they can. Uh, they can do that. Basically, I had mentioned there's a uh, there's that Fluency Tutor extension. So students can go to any content that they find that they find interesting, use the Fluency Tutor extension to to create. Uh, and we have videos on this. I know it's hard to to see this when I'm explaining it verbally. But yes, students can go find content, create it, practice reading, and even share it with a teacher if they would like to. Uh, but it gives them a way to practice reading. And there's even a way in Read and Write, there's a feature called Practice Reading Allow that they can use there as well. So multiple ways that students can practice even without the teacher assigning anything. Awesome, thanks. And then Kathleen, I have a couple Read and Write questions for you. Do the students have, have to open the document or the PDF with Read and Write in order to see the teacher comments? Yeah, it depends on how the comments are made. So if the teacher uses read and write to make comments, um, like maybe add annotations or voice notes, the student will need to open it with read and write to see those. Um, but if they are doing feedback through like the normal Google Classroom methods, you wouldn't necessarily have to open it with read and write to see those. Thanks. And um, a follow up question here is um, to share assignments with the PDF reader. Do you have to use Classroom? Um, the workflow that I showed there where there was an actual button on the toolbar, that is only available for Google Classroom. Um, but I did mention if you use the Schoology LMS, um, we're also very soon going to have a workflow for that that integrates right with the PDF reader. Um, and even if you're using something else, you know, you may not have that, that assign button right on the toolbar, um, but as long as you assign a PDF in a way that the student can open it up in their browser or maybe open it up in Google Drive, um, they will have the ability to use the PDF tools in there. Great, thanks Kathleen. And Mark, I have a couple of RIQ questions for you. Um, can students minimize the RIQ meter if they're easily distracted when they're writing? Yeah, they can. They can um, minimize it and You'll still see the numbers. Um, I just didn't get a chance to show that. Um, you'll still see the numbers. You just won't see um, that whole burst meter part of it. Um, and you can always close it out. If you do close it out, it won't uh, count any of the burst things. But the the minimized version um, is pretty good at, at avoiding distractions or preventing distractions. Thanks. And um, how does RIQ grade different drafts of a developing assignment? Um, so you can go in, uh, I didn't get a chance to show that, but I should have, um, on the sidebar, you just click the rescore button. Um, the inserted image will only show the most recent one, um, but you can always uh, just go back into the revision history to see the older uh, version if you need to. Um, and everything is tracked in the dashboard. So it actually pretty easily, um, it's it's sort of built for kids to edit and resubmit. You can just click rescore right in the sidebar. Great, thanks. Yep. Um, and I guess a, across uh, the team here, were there any questions um, that you saw in the chat box that you'd like to share with the rest of the attendees? Uh, yeah, I can speak to, I saw a question here. Um, I believe Ms. Franco here at the very bottom said she's having some difficulty envisioning how to use this with uh, primary students, in particular first grade. Um, so I was writing her back and letting her know that if she'd like some more specific examples about that. Um, Caitlin, another one I think was, uh, are they gonna get the slide deck? And I believe that's gonna be emailed, right? Yes, that will be included okay. in the email okay. tomorrow. Okay, so back to Olivia then. Olivia, when she does uh, send out the slide deck email, you'll have a copy of all of our email addresses uh, and, and uh, Twitter handles, if you will. So however you wanna reach out to us, we might be able to share you some more specific examples about how it can be used in first grade. Uh, I don't mind sending you some elementary resources for the math components. Um, and again, I, I have a first grader at home uh, and my son has used Equatio in MassBase uh, to practice telling time uh, and other different activities within mass space, at least specifically with the equatio. So thank you for your question. 
Great, thanks, Louis. Um, I think we might wrap the questions up uh, for today, but if for some reason we didn't get to one of the ones you asked, we can follow up with you directly from the webinar. Uh, we'll have your email so we can follow up with you directly. And then lastly, I just wanna thank Kathleen, Louis, Mark, and Jason for the presentation today. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us. And we all hope you have a great rest of your day. Great, right. thanks everyone. See you, bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye.